nervous system can be in a stressful situation in the very given moment in time. It will get stressed, but the stress will fail to leave an imprint long enough for impeding the otherwise freedom of that nervous system to function in accord with the laws of nature. So, if that situation is given, there is no need for religion, no need for spiritual practices, no need for the term spirituality, because we are already cosmic at a given. We are already in sync, vibrating here as an expression of one and the only reality. Let's hypothesize for a moment, make it very simple. There is this perspective that human nervous system is an expression of consciousness. Of course, it's a consciousness-based model. As most of you, I'm sure, aware, we are amidst that continued dialogue, continued, let's say, debates among the scientific communities in terms of primacy of consciousness, which is not at all accepted by the mainstream of science. And it is the situation now well into its whatever X decade the conversation has been going on for quite a while, but more emphatically, I would say, since the 90s, since the early 90s, it's been going on already since the 60s, it's been going on since the 30s, the suggestions were made. In 1930s, these suggestions were made already based on the breakthroughs in quantum physics, in quantum mechanics. The suggestions were made, of course, already in the 19th century, with the advancement of spiritual teachings into the West, during the great cross-pollination of cultures, ideas, and so forth. Let's not confuse here religious perspectives, which always had consciousness-based model, where consciousness was, of course, is that idea of God. That's a different animal altogether. We're not speaking about this. We're speaking about this, how it is viewed in the framework of understanding in our culturally accepted consensus on the matter of things. So that whether consciousness is primary or matter is primary and consciousness is the result of some kind of evolution or consciousness is the result of some biochemical processes in the brain is not at all a settled affair. Far from. Each time you have a private conversation with this, let's say, those who are at the forefront of that, at the, the, the frontier of all these more avant-garde ideas, which are nothing avant-garde about it. It's a reinstatement of something that has been already known for millennia. But, you know, the old warriors like Deepak Chopra has been battling this now for five decades, battling it out there in the scientific community for which he has been severely criticized. Just look into his Wikipedia page and it has a whole chapter, whole chapter where and how Deepak Chopra is criticized for his outlandish, supposedly, propositions. All this is being considered jumbo-mambo or mambo-jumbo, whichever way you prefer, of modern science, that this is called pseudoscience. 
So it's not easy to speak about this at a given because some of us may not have this configured. There is not collectively settled consensus on where the primacy of consciousness has been established or re-established. The majority out there, the vote goes towards either no, we don't have evidence for that, we don't have enough data for that, or, well, I cannot put my bets on it. So, in other words, I'm not going to give my vote. So this is why we still live. This work, therefore, remains to be on the fringes of culture and cannot be cons considered to be a, a mainstream. Moreover, the whole New Age culture, New Age culture is considered to be on the fringes of the general culture, what is overly accepted. Yes, just because in some universities, just because there are many books out there, many speakers, many public people openly, vocally speak about these matters and dedicated their lives to these matters, that does not mean that that's the picture. It doesn't mean if our preferences on our, whatever the algorithm throws to us, in the Google search or the YouTube search throws to us based on our preferences. And if we constantly have the feed of the Deepak Chopra, Greg Burden, you know, Bruce Lipton, Dr. Joe Dispenza, and so on, it may come across as, well, we are living among the complete and utter renaissance. There is this total and utter agreement on this, universally shared agreement. No, far from it. The majority of scientific community is still keeps to the ideas that we do not know, excuse my New York slang, shit from Shainola when it comes to the matters of primacy of consciousness or primacy, primacy of matter. Well, consciousness per se, at least it entered the dialogue. Yes, thank you. But it's, uh, it's also uh, saying today. It's, it's very much the, well, it's, it's the, some say that it's very much the current talk of town, the current conversation. Yes, because science has, has been very clearly put together by presentation of one of its, let's say, those more avant-garde, from the avant-garde echelons of science, someone whom I met and befriended over the years and even shared the panel, Menas Kafatas, who is a quantum physicist, in one of his deliveries at the Science and Duality in California, circa 2015, 16 perhaps, he gave a talk on impossibility for this to be ever settled, simply because science is based on the process of observation. It's based on the very dynamic of observer observed. It's based on coming up with some quantifiable data based on the phenomena that is being observed which is then obviously mathematically very, have to be verifiable. Any of you have watched Oppenheimer, which the movie that made its wave recently, well, you may have missed, but the much talked about film. To begin with, it's directed by one of the very few true filmmakers of our time, Christopher Noland, known for his brilliant cinematography. So his latest work, Oppenheimer, about the creator, creator in parenthesis we should use, of the atomic bomb, because he did not create the atomic bomb. He was simply being placed in charge of the project, the project that he has directed, conducted. Atomic bomb was already created as a possibility before, way before. 
But in that film, there were very interesting, quick exchanges, dialogues, and particularly when the this very strong team was put together, right? In the place found in New Mexico, where as we know that famous ominously sounding Los Alamos, the place where the first test is de was destined to take place. The most brilliant assembly of scientists of its time have been gathered together. The most, I would say, extraordinary team, speaking about the Avengers, you know, these were the real Avengers of its time. The best, best biologists, mathematicians, physicists of its time, engineers of its time, creme de la creme. We're talking about 40s. We're talking about the time when the whole Europe, the whole world in the war. So majority of the scientists ended up in the United States anyway, the likes of Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. So these conversations casually spoken, of course, for the purpose of making the film also sounding authentic. There are these lines when whatever is being su suggested, the Oppenheimer played by um, Killian Murphy, the Peaky Blinders actor, right? Some of you may um, be aware of whom I'm talking about. He did a brilliant job and he's just like, okay, can you verify that? And he speaks to the greatest mathematician of his time. So everything is done has to be verified mathematically. This is the language of science. Mathematics is the language of science. Whatever may come to Albert Einstein in a dream as the greatest revelation, and purportedly most of his revelations came to him in a dream. He worked with that dimension consciously. The only, only logistic would be after to verify it mathematically, because that's how it then would gain a possibility for any reckoning, let alone recognition. See? So when it comes to this sketching, drawing, speaking about these matters, we're speaking on the, out, on the outer fringes of the modern culture. Moreover, what's happening in our workshops, still, still, on the outer fringes of the new age, you see, if New Age itself as a global phenomena is on the fringes of the global culture, what is happening here is on the fringes of the New Age. So if you want to see this cosmological perspective, we are like in this deep, dark, like province of the galaxy of, the, of whatever's happening, tucked away somewhere, you see? Sitting in the middle of Vienna, shouting, having to shut all the windows and doors, because the neighbors will complain, you know, as they did inevitably. So the question now is like, what do we do? Can we come back to the city of Vienna? It's under the question. We might have to. The dark side of Vienna. Yeah, we might have to look for an outskirts of Vienna, find like some old forbidden revamp, kind of like a barn, right? and just settle for that for a while, right, the time, with some stay hack, hay, haystack and, and the sheep and the, right? No eating chicken's wings, please, there, we have to, you know, we're, we're, yeah. So, so this whole thing is very, very peculiar. So just assuming that we speak from somehow accepted paradigm, far from it. So what am I trying to say now then? What I'm trying to say is that it's thinking against the grain of collective consciousness. Verstein, what was that I adjusted? Verstein? Yeah. In, 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 in tiendo. You know, to compris, This is like, do you understand the, do you, do you understand the 
the predicament. So there are, of course, these voices. There are. These voices have been out there, as we have just now touched upon in that sweeping overview from the historical perspective, reaching all the way back to 150 years. Well, 150 years when it was vocally truly expressed. Before that, no. Not before, not before some of the work that was brought about by existentialists, where we've started this program on Friday night, Friday evening, that this whole thing was brought to question. Parad paradox here, monistic religions, called monistic religions, operate with the same paradigm as modern science. They operate with the paradigm observer observed, not knowing that God is an ideal. God is an idea. It, all, it took the beings of likes of Soren Kierkegaard, Arthur Schopenhauer, and finally Friedrich Nietzsche, culminating in the works of Martin Heidegger, to question the whole premise of Western philosophy in terms of its taking a side road from the question of being from the centrality of being, the centrality of the question. So this is very important that religion was operating, which meant to unite, on the principle of observer observed. That relationship was steadfasted by the God, the Almighty, the idea, and the creation. And then all this creatures in the creation and their relationship to God. And then it's all down to metaphysics, down to Nicene code of conduct of how what is being accepted, considered to be not a blasphemy. How many great mystics had to denounce what they said? They had to. Some of them had to. Mystics had to adjust what they pronounced at some point. We know that Meister Eichert had to do that. So this is the perspective we are speaking of. So when speaking from, this is why, whenever I'm critical of non-duality, and most of you know that I am vocally critical, this is my job. It in line with the tradition, where the peers in the field meant to be given a good stab in terms of that healthy exchange of perspectives and it is within the tradition, Indian tradition, when two different camps debate the nature of consciousness. But I always take my hat off for this extraordinary attempt at reconciling this paradigm. So non-duality as a movement, whether this is neo advaita whether this is you know, non-duality per se, what have you, was unprecedented event in our history still remains to be unprecedented because it was an attempt to reconcile this what also has been an ongoing conversation in some of the highest echelons of intellectual life on the planet for 150 years the primacy of consciousness or awareness, as it is more preferred, in the non-duality circles. So this is why speaking about this is always speaking, as I have said just a moment ago, against the grain of collective consciousness. This is an insight for you to contemplate on why, with every stroke of progress, there is being pushed back. Because the collective consciousness still, by large, holds different perspectives. So there are many, 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 many islands and units and all this rising new paradigm, but they are not yet have amalgamated enough. This is, takes us back to the work of brilliant quantum physicists who abandoned his career entirely in 
favor of communication with the sage of his time. I'm speaking about David Bohm and his friendship relationship with Jiddu Krishnamurti. He was considered to be a complete and utter failure, and nutter, David Bohm, reticled in the academia. He was the most brilliant physicist of his time. He was heralded as a new Niels Borg and new Einstein, and yet he forsakes it all, and after meeting Jiddu Krishnamurti, he resigns from the career and begins a series of his trips to India, because at that time, Jiddu Krishnamurti was already spending a lot more time in India than in the United States or Europe. As some of you know, Jiddu Krishnamurti was this phenomenon that India produced and produces from time to time. Born in India, educated from a very early age in post-Victorian England, heralded by the Madame Blavatskaya, as the new messiah, and was prepped, tutored, honed for that role to take as a leader of this newly formed organization, which he dispersed at the biggest gathering where he was supposed to be inaugurated. He just basically said, you're giving me this power, I'm, I'm renouncing this whole order. Okay? So, the bottom line is, is, David Bohm is known for this work, Implicate Order, where he spoke about this and about his dissatisfaction with the state of affairs in even the most forward-thinking scientific community at the time. Because some of the fundamental notions, such as love, empathy, compassion, have not been addressed by scientists. And to him, he felt, it's lacking fundamental qualities of what all human beings experience. And if we are all embedded with consciousness, before we settle on the fact that we all are, in fact, consciousness, not just conscious, consciousness per se. These are the fundamental qualities that are at the very primal state of affairs, what it means to be human being. So he began his journey there and then already. We can see that. And, of course, it only took that encounter for it to outline the trajectory of his end of, for the rest of his life. And, indeed, that's what happened to him. But his implicate order speaks to the phenomenon of the collective consciousness. At the very same time, a lot have been spoken about collective consciousness. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was already initiating the Beatles in India into transcendental meditation, where the term collective consciousness has been in wide use by then. So that phenomena of collective consciousness is what we speak to right now. That phenomena of what dominates the collective mind. So to rise above the dominion of the collective mind takes more than just thinking freely on topics we prefer. You see? Why? Because at the surface value, we are agreeing, yes, we listen to Greg Burden, we listen to Deepak Chopra, we listen to Joe Dispenza, we hear this, this and that speaker, and we are completely in line. It totally makes sense. Oh, lesser known figures like, you know, hardcore spiritual, let's say, crowds. But then we are pushed back in our habitual thinking. Think why, why that is. That's what I mean. It's like you swim in the river. You think you're making some strides forward, but you are progressing very little because there is maybe unperceptible, but there is this current, this current, this movement. So the global movement as it is, is not consciousness-based model. So this is what we here bring now to our attention. And in the implicate order, David Bohm spoke about this shift in paradigm becomes possible only when there are enough units, those the same like in the microstructure. 
when these units of newly rising culture appear simultaneously, because that's what it is, it's known as that effect, simultaneously. It is examined even within the modern sciences. The paradox, the phenomena of, you, I, you know what I'm talking about, no? When two things occur in the same system. It is only possible in quantum physics. It's not possible in the Newtonian mechanics. It is not possible to occupy the same, sp that two systems cannot occupy the same space, same reality. In quantum physics, it is possible. Like this whole idea, the marvel, the movie-making machine, plays with, right? This Ant-Man, this man, that, right? All this, right? All this venturing into the quantum world, right? All this, like, parallel reality. It's toying with the ideas which have been already the stuff of the scientific conversation for decades. So this reality, this reality is coexistent reality. In some of our more recent videos, we re-examined and talked about it with the new, let's say, verve, instilling it with maybe additional layers, you know, levels of understanding, how everything is at once, at once. The field of energy or the waves whilst also exhibiting qualities of something in particular. This is quantum physics. <coughs> Double slit experiment is for children to be introduced to the quantum mechanics, the quantum physics. Double slit experiment. Please Google and look into that. If you have no idea, this simple explanation will give you direct insight what that is, because in that experiment, which was a complete and utter revelation, scientists did not expect that. They stumbled on that. That the light and sound display qualities of both waves and particles. Not only that, they display that simultaneously. That was nothing short of revolution. So in other words, Everything that we've considered to be, prior to that, a material reality gains another dimension. So it is indeed material, has shape, form, density, but at the very same time, based on that double slit experiment, it is also a field of energy. So this cup with the water contained in it, as well as the hand that holds it and the body to which the hand belongs, is both something made out of particles, something which can display solidity, whilst at the very same time, nothing other than frequencies of waves. That's why we've entered the freaky world, as some scientists use, it's not my language. The word freaky was used by scientists, like in the, what the bleep do we know? How many of you watch What the Blip? Okay, so some, still something to catch up. It's now getting like a, it's getting kind of like gray and bold like myself, the, the What the Blip. But at some point it was like a cutting edge, you know. What is, 2006, 2005 came out? Someone can maybe correct me, like something, circa that time. There was this, I forgot his name. He was always sat in front of the fount. Of course, the background was uh, faked. Uh, all of them sat in the in the in the studios, and then they, the producers of that film, who were themselves quirky, young, and upbeat, they thought, "Well, since this is about quantum physics and spirituality, why don't we spin it out?" So they cr created this superimposition, superimposition uh, settings. So the scientist who was very excited, his this hair like a bit like an, a little bit like Einstein alike, like this kind of, you know. He was sitting in front of the fountain and he said, if once you've been introduced to the basic axioms of the quantum physics, doesn't make you freaky, 
then you did not understand the thing. It stuck with me because it's a brilliant way of putting it. If it doesn't make you freak out, it means you did not understand the thing, says the man who is like whole, his whole life is in it. So this, what we speak of here, is of primal importance because this is squarely tantric. Everything we spoke so far is in alignment with this understanding, waves versus particles, displaying the qualities of both at the very same time. All of us are here as a walking unit, sitting, walking, eating, sleeping, whatever, letting go. We are here both at once. Something in particular, whilst at the very same time, nothing other than field of energy. This is what meant to be or ideally should make an impression on you. Because then you would understand why these speakers come out, why Joe Dispenza basking and capitalizing on all this, like, you know, manifesting. Yes, from that point of view, everything is possible. From that point of view, walking through walls is possible. From that point of view, remember that Hollywood film with the brilliant cast, uh, Men Who Stare at the Goat? Because you have to catch up, not just with tantrum ideas. It has George Clooney, it has legendary, uh, you know, legendary actors. What's his name there? Um, hmm? Yes, of course. It's a brilliant cast. It's the whole film based on, it's based on facts. It's even at the, at the beginning it says, and they also say that no goats were hurt during the film. So just for the animal lovers, no goats were hurt. <laughs> you know, not just chickens, no goats even. So, brilliant cast, okay, brilliant. Jeff Bridges there, come on. Jeff Bridges and George Clooney in one movie. It doesn't come. It's like, and it's like uh, CIA doing experiments with all this psychic phenomena that has been abound since the 60s, right? Because it was very well known. Both complexes, you know, Soviet Union and the United States, were busy in the lab and the researches working with these guys. In Soviet Union in particular, I remember growing up, I remember very well, this was not even classified information. There were many yogis hanging around and transported from India. India was having very strong ties with Soviet Union, historically. But anyway, um, Indira Gandhi particularly, when she was a prime minister of India. So they, like, they made it, they've organized it. Not just any would-be yogis, not the gymnastics. I'm talking about Ayanga, what, whatever, your Bihar. I'm not talking about this. Real yogis from Himalayas begged, can you come to Moscow, please? You know, please, please. I don't have a passport. I, do you understand? I renounce the world. What Moscow? I am, I am Moscow. I am Moscow, you know? So, like, a, no. Convinced them, you know? So they all went there, displayed their powers and everything. It's the same in the United States. I don't know, they might be having a harder time to get yogis to the States, because the Americans were thinking, you can lure everyone, but how can you lure yogi? With what? Uh, uh, mm. Mm, okay, well, might have to become humble and simply ask. So they asked, they did, but these were very well-known experiments. So the CIA and the KGB, what have you, they all conducted that, a plenty. You know that this was conducted going back to the 30s. This is going back to the pre, before the Second World War. The Nazi Germany was very well known for all this interest in everything occult that some of the members of the party were known belonging to these occult orders. 
Not many of you may know that, but it's a fact. Many of them were fluent in some of the texts that were in circulation at the time of the Tibetan yogis, of Milarepa, of all this work, of all this what came and considered to be the greatest, deepest kept secrets. Hitler himself was obsessed by that, obsessed with the idea of ideal warrior, ideal soldier, ideal. You see? So that notion, until it goes into the fantastic trilogy of Jason Bohr, I trust you watch at least that one. Raise your hands who watched Jason Bourne, Bourne, Bourne series. Okay, you're doing better now. You will. And come on, Matt Damon, you know, Matt Damon and his prime. Well before that kind of, right, creating this, right, killing machine, right, where you extract six bullets from his back, when you float him out from the sea, and by the time you reach the shore, the guy's gone again. This is his power of his longevity. So what, this film now, Man Who Stared at the Goats, is all about that, you see? But it's a comedy, light-hearted with maybe some black humor because it's all happening there in modern days, and they all did, even go now, they are revamped all this battalion of the psychic battalion and send them to Iraq now or to Afghanistan, I don't remember exactly. For them to, because there is a need rose. So all this detour, right, for you to catch up on your education of the uh, modern culture, pop culture, movie culture, is to illustrate this phenomenology that quantum physics, quantum physics is not just a theoretical science. So we did indeed, this Oppenheimer is a very ambitious project. Yes, it is custom for every filmmaker to say that what they just now produced is the most important work. Every artist speaks that language. But there is something very timely about that particular film, about that particular theme. What was theoretical was made possible. It was pure theory, pure theory. It happened not here, I'm saying, not in Austria, it happened in Germany. Hmm? Heisenberg's uncertainty principle gave and Albert Einstein's musings post his theory of relativity gave way to the possibility of the creation of the atomic bomb. So in other words, what was pure theoretical science becomes a reality. So it's very easy to, oh yes, atomic bomb, there's so many, so much stuff out there, there like hold this race, hold this, like there are some, by the way, mind uh, blowing material out there that I came across, where they show how many tests were conducted in both Soviet Union back then and the United States during the height of the Cold War. And there's a brilliant comment at the very top of that video that what, what a bizarre thing, whilst racing to blow up each other, right? USSR and USA blew themselves up continuously in uninterrupted chain of events of blowing up atomic bombs. Brits were much smarter. They never detonated any atomic bomb in Great Britain. No, they did it in Australia, in a typical fashion. It's like, you know, can we, like, you know, we're old friends. We're not asking as a colony. We're not going to just come and say, we're going to do the test. Can we do the test? Thank you. So 
But the Russians and the Americans, right, to kind of generalize, they kept blowing it up on their own territory. You know? So what becomes theoretical science becomes reality. That's the question brought to examination. And it's a fact. And in other words, any doubts that quantum physics were just an ideology, a new ideology, new possibility, have been put to rest. Please be attentive. I'd like to develop it. Maybe it will not happen at this particular gathering. But I'd like to develop this line of thought that has been already seeded last year and some of the sprouts came in our programs, longer programs in Mallorca and just more recently in June and July at the Good Soundstuff in Germany, where I was speaking about this, why this is also speaking of, you know, how everything is divine, how everything here is indeed, what's the one of the proof of everything is consciousness, you see? Neither Heisenberg nor Einstein nor Oppenheimer acted on their own volition. None of them act from their own human place, no matter how great is the pressure of history. This is an interesting thing. It's something happens in the domain of consciousness. And that's why there is a possibility of no longer playing dice with God, but actually playing chess with God and not even, not even withholding the move of checkmating, checkmating. That's what it is. The creation of the atomic bomb was a confirmation that everything is possible. So this whole thing, that's why governments were subsidizing these experiments in the United States and in Soviet Union, exemplified now, we laugh at it when we look at it in that dark comedy, black comedy, Men Who Stare at the goat, Goats, where psychic battalions, as a matter of fact, they have existed. Psychic battalions, they were made out of selected individuals who were selected for whatever they where tests they went, for whatever qualities they exhibited. So to test further eminent possibilities of going beyond what otherwise is accepted reality of Newtonian laws of physics. But what is of value for us here, if you want to now kind of like begin to wonder, what is it all about? Did I check myself again into the wrong retreat? First we scream the top of our heads and then we talk about movies all the time. This is primarily to bring to your attention that all this is, happens within the field of pure potentialities. The very human affair is a field of pure potentialities. Of course there is a causation of course, there are a lot of other laws intact. So it is not just based on easily being sold this concept of what are the laws of manifestation based on how to manifest reality you want to live. In any case, those who promulgate, sell and promote these courses bound to revisit good old again Deepak. Good old Deepak. Revamp that whole teaching of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in the pocket size of the book known as Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. Who remembers this book? Good. Pocket edition. Well, if you have a big acro like kind of salvage jacket that will certainly fit in, right? Type two with an internal, like, with, like it will go inside the internal pocket. <laughs> it's not pocket for the, you know, coins or cigarettes, right? It's like in a Western shirt, 
It won't fit into this pocket. That's what I'm saying. So it's not like a pocket Bible for this to carry it close to your heart. So seven spiritual laws of success. Deepak brings the teaching of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the course I intimately am familiar with, into the masses, into the public. You read that and first think that you'll be astonished that before all these guys and girls who came out now about how to manifest, they forgot the principal fundamental laws to include there. And these laws are the laws of acceptance. See? The spiritual laws of success, seven of them, begins with the law of acceptance. And then it goes, you see? All throughout this spiritual laws of success or behind success contain fundamental or what was known to all spiritual folks for millennia. There's nothing new in it. It's just succinctly put together in the most accessible way possible and in the most convincingly in the most convincing <coughs> form and format. I highly recommend. It's an eye-opener. An eye-opener, because it also speaks of empathy and compassion, which apparently is you cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot just desire things without actually considering that all this is interconnected. Just, I want it, and I want it now, or I can get no satisfaction, right? And that is not what the manifesting based on. Manifesting based on fundamentally first acknowledging, recognizing, and living the reality of utter and entire interconnectedness of it all. And then, of course, some of these quantum things spiced up there. That's the brilliance of Deepak, who truly has that gift of make something popular, bringing it to the masses. He takes that, what belongs to the hardcore, or maybe like this spiritual circles, and that what belongs to the conversation within the scientific community, and weaves it together. And the outcome is, of course, this very convincing convincing propositions there. So there are these quantum things, and some of these are indeed what is already mentioned as a freaky thing. Nothing to do with walking through the walls. But the fact is that one is, one is a field of energy and waves as well as considering oneself to be the body and all its functioning and thoughts. And all this is, all this is forever and ever part of the greater electromagnetic field. See? So this is why Tantra today is so hot that quantum scientists now begin to use the word Kali, Shiva, because they're fed up with all these clinical terms. It's somehow pregnant and charged with new possibilities. See? Everyone says electromagnetism, electromagnetism. Yeah, first, like, you know, four principal laws of nature. Heat, weak, strong interactions, gravity, and electromagnetism. Bust. But what is it? Ah, Kali, okay. Kali, the great principle of attraction and repulsion. This is the grand unifying force. This is Kali, the grand unifying force. This is the entire, this is cosmic prana. The, that is the cosmic prana. This is the Chit Shakti, Kali. At the individual level it is expressed as Kundalini. 
in each and every human being. That very principle, see? Electrical principle, the principle of electricity, light. So, this is in just outlining this to understand why we are given this task. And the task is that we are always swimming against the tide that currently is still prevalent. When the change of tide will happen, when the change of the current will happen, we don't know. Maybe it's happening as we speak. Maybe this, what we do here, in this very small numbers, is being replicated in many, 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 many units on the planet Earth, in a variety of ways. I will still continue challenging this perspective. Each time I speak on something, oh, I like when he speaks about that, but as soon as he speaks about the weed and about the ayahuasca, the guy doesn't know shit from Shainola. I like when he speaks about meditation and kundalini. As soon as he speaks about hallucinogenic drugs, or as soon as he speaks about the, you know, plants, consciousness altering substances, he doesn't know anything. No, I'm not talking about ayahuasca retreats. No. I'm talking about this kind of retreats. Not where one took a pill, drank a bowl, ate a mushroom, and thinking that the wings are blowing, but these are chicken wings. Borrowing this. Borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. Give the credits later at the end. So, how far they can take you? Not only that, they fry chicken wings as well, in the cheapest sauce. They fry your system each time you take it. The nervous system becomes brittle and you think you are getting access to the devis and the divinities. So I said, I will continue debunking this whole thing. You know, I don't care if people then, like, you know, reticle that. Marijuana. I've done with the marijuana in my teens. It was a thing of to do when you play with toys. I smoked pot when I was 12. This is why I'm like, being a father is a terrible thing. Because you compare yourself with your son, your daughter, and think, I was already doing this by that. Ah, God save me. Nightmare of all parents. By the age of 18, I was not interested in pot. Not interested. Done with it. It was passe. Just like toys you played with. And you put them on a shelf and they get dusty. You pass them on to someone. There's a whole market now. It's going to be already now. It's just a matter of time when the big pharma kicks in together with the, what are they like, you know, industries that sell booze and cigarettes that nobody buys as much now. They sold in the third world. They produced in the third world. Marlboro and Camel, all produced in Uzbekistan now. Produced in Uzbekistan and sold immediately. Because foolish folk there, village folk, think that they can smoke Marlboro, they're cool. Little do they know that it was cool for cowboy-like looking guys to smoke Marlboro in the 50s and the 60s until the best model became a cancer, diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. So it was no, long, it was no longer cool to smoke cigarettes. So marijuana is about to be legalized everywhere. So taxes can be paid on it and harvested. There's no marijuana left. Just watch, educate yourself. No, none of marijuana left that is real marijuana. It's all genetic freak, genetically modified. Um, Cross-cultured. So all this, I don't have the language for it because I don't have enough cortexes to hold it all. But it all has these capitalized letters, TNC, C, whatever. The good part in it is being on the decline since the 60s. So the 
one of the facts that no smokers want to accept is that the other part that makes you filled with anxiety is on the rise exponentially. So the part that is, has this calming, allergenic, analgenic, and generally pacifying is on decline. And the part that is, makes you agitated and makes your nervous system to basically go haywire is on the rise. These are facts. Documentaries are made about that. So all this is important that we do have a true sense of Shraddha, that what we do in these gatherings is to create the possibility of that point where the tie begins to move in another direction when spiritual work will be that much easier. But to take us where we have started in this impromptu, improvised largely, delivery, if our nervous system, which is, remember the very first sentence uttered, that there, is, there are perspectives, perennial perspectives, that the human nervous system is an expression of all cosmic laws. Human nervous system is an expression of consciousness. And then we took a detour because we had to speak about it with all due to what it requires that we cannot just assume that human nervous system is an expression of consciousness. Well, I'm sorry, dear, that is not a scientifically validated or verifiable fact. It's a hearsay. That's why we talked about this just now. So the collective consensus creates that tie. But if we are to accept that, then the state of the human nervous system here is all there is. If the state of the nervous system is such that it at once acts at these both poles of its extremes, as that what is an expression of one and the only observer. And that what is observed at the very same time, and there is a harmony between that, then no stress sets into the system. It cannot. A nervous system can be in a stressful situation in the very given moment in time. It will get stressed, but the stress will fail to leave an imprint long enough for impeding the otherwise freedom of that nervous system to function in accord with the laws of nature. So if that situation is given, there is no need for religion, no need for spiritual practices, no need for the term spirituality, because we are already cosmic at a given. We are already in sync vibrating here as an expression of one and the only reality. And this reality is not some kind of epiphenomenon. This is the manifestation of the reality for which there is no language. And through the language that this reality comes up with, this reality becomes a possibility. So you see, this is now moved to the ultimate nature of things. That is at once the reality as the potentiality, the reality of who we are, and the reality of how it is manifest temporarily. The never changing and the ever changing. As His Holiness Maharishi Mahesh Yogi used to say, known for saying it quite often, the never changing and the ever-changing. The whole dynamics are between the never-changing and the ever-changing. This is what human being in essence is. This is where the Shiva hides himself 
out of his own violation and goes into hiding, gone to earth. And our bodies are that, expression of that final element, Bhumi, earth. 